This episode is brought to you by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Go to aaomc.org and join us. Join the war against the myopia epidemic. Okay, welcome to The Corrected View. This is a podcast about ortho -K. It's a podcast about myopia control and the people devoted to its role in specialty care. And oftentimes we find ourselves with uh, topics that are adjacent to myopia control and specialty care. And one of those is staffing. And I brought on Dr. Nick Despeditas, who's my monthly Q&A panelist. Uh, Nick, welcome back to the uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Right, and this is a this is a fantastic topic. We've been getting some questions saying, "Can you address Nick the uh, staffing issues that a lot of docs are facing right now because of the pandemic, because of the uh, the situation with staff members or, or or associate doctors?" But I also think this this is a very relevant topic because I once talked to an optometrist who said, "You know, I would love to do ortho -K in my practice, but my staff just isn't into it." And I was like, "What are you talking about? Your staff isn't into it. it seems like you need to reassign your your whole ethos of your office because your staff should be on board. And you know better than anybody how important staff is to a practice. Absolutely. So let's start with that. Like, why is why is staff so fundamentally important to an ortho -K or myopia management practice? And then we'll get into the rest." Yeah, I, I would start with why would this doctor's staff not be interested in embracing myopia control? And the answer is pretty straightforward, is it's more work for them. And they've probably got this type of initiative several times before. We are going to do a dry eye clinic. We're going to do, uh, you know, this macula testing, and we're going to bring in this instrument and that instrument. So basically what staff is perceiving is not a better quality of life, is more work. So the, I learned this the hard way. I brought in practice uh, myopia management in 2002 when um, Paragon uh, got first FDA approval back then. So we're talking about 19 years ago and was doing it before then, but dabbling. And I remember calling my staff and saying, hey guys, ortho -K finally got FDA approved. We've been waiting for this for so long. And, and I was trying to get them excited. And really when I looked out at my staff, let's say there was about 15, 20 people, I saw blank faces because really the question I wasn't answering was what's in it for me. And I think that's really what you have to answer. They're not gonna get excited about myopia management or any other specialty you bring into your office unless you answer that question first. That's been my experience. So do you offer uh, incentives or uh, commissions on, on uh, ortho -K cases or for staff members that go above and beyond? No. So we're going to talk about this maybe a little bit later on when we're talking about the challenges all of us have in getting good staff. But incentives, spiffing, so to speak, in my opinion, don't work over the long term. So if you have a meeting and you say, listen, whoever helps and goes beyond or whoever signs these people up or makes appointments is going to get an extra X, Y, Z, it's not sustainable. It has to be something organic, something fundamental. So in our case, things change when we said, listen, we're going to bring our myopia management. It's going to be hard. These patients are demanding or they're going to ask a lot of questions. But in return, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, for example, in our office, we started dropping insurances. So we don't have to do so much paperwork. We don't have to get rejections. We don't have to answer all these questions and try to circumvent the system of managed care. We're also going to close Saturdays, which was a big thing. So now we're going to go from a six-day week to five-day week because the each myopia management patient will produce more than our primary care. We're also going to do... Um, you have just less patients. This was another thing, less patients, so less volume. So we don't feel exhausted at the end of the day. These are things at least they suspiciously listen to saying, wow, I guess if he's right and I am seeing less patients throughout the day, I won't be as exhausted. If I'm closing Saturdays, I can either work somewhere else or I can enjoy it with my family. And you know what? He's right. We're seeing more and more insurance patients 
And it just doesn't seem like my salary is going up according to how hard I'm working. Gotcha. So what is the, what is the ideal uh, way to get staff fired up? I've heard that I've heard that uh, some doctors, like they close the office, they come back from Vision by Design boot camp, they close the office, they have a presentation ready, they explain why this is so vital and important and how things are going to change and what the staff's role is, including, you know, you may even be training a myopia control coordinator or myopia management coordinator in your office. Yeah, I, I, I tried that doesn't seem to work because mm. they've heard it from me so many times before. Whenever I come back from a meeting, I often buy something or I've mm -hmm. committed to something and they just have learned, or at least previously, let Dr. D be all excited about this. It'll fizzle out and then he'll be distracted by something else. I think you have to make a conscious decision to talk to your staff honestly, the way we did it, and this was decades ago, is saying, listen, do, do you notice we're not selling as many glasses as we did mm. just two, three years ago? And then they're all getting, yeah, absolutely. People are taking their scripts. They're getting it from Warby Parker, Costco, online, whatever the, the conversation goes. Do you also notice that we're getting audited more from certain insurances or requesting records do you notice that we're doing more paperwork, seeing more patients, but our gross revenue is not necessarily going up? Certainly our net is. And mm -hmm. that's where the discussion lies. So let's say someone out there wants to start talking about their staff today. This is how I would do it. Does everyone notice that we're paying more for gas? We're pay and then someone's going to shout, yeah, Dr. D, I'm paying more for everything. And do you know if our reimbursements from our insurance companies have gone up and that's where everybody's going to laugh because they haven't. And then someone else may say, as a matter of fact, a lot of the coding that we used to do years past has now been lumped together in a visit fee as opposed to a separate provision uh, uh, procedure. Punctal plugs have been lumped in. You know, extended off the mosque, being retinal photographs have been lumped in. Years ago, uh, a OCT or optic nerve head tomography or uh, was lumped into a bilateral procedure. So it's just like, and I would make my staff laugh. Just imagine you go to the mechanic and they say, hey, Nick, you need four brakes. You need your, your brakes are done. And the, the job is going to cost, I don't know, let's say $800. And I say, you know what? I'm going to pay just for two because you're going to take the tires off anyway. And that's what I'm willing to take. And the mechanic says, all right. And that's kind of what we do in medicine. It's sad. You know, a company decides to make a bilateral procedure reimbursed together. And then we just accept it. So that's how I would try to talk in their terms. You have to talk about salary for them in general, saying, listen, if we're not growing, if our profitability is not growing, then really there's no way I can even raise you the cost of inflation, which right now may be three or 4%. And that's where then you bring myopia management into the staff. It's very similar, Matt, mm -hmm. to what I do when I talk to patients about myopia management. I don't go, okay. hey, there's an ortho K lens. It, you sleep with it. You wear it at night. You wake up. You don't need glasses. And guess what? It may slow down your child's myopia from getting worse because myopia has a lot of potential side effects. I don't start that way. I start talking about what the parent can relate to. What is that? You've heard me speak a hundred times. What do parents relate to? Yeah, they relate to personal experience and they relate is, to... Go ahead. Yeah. Which is what? What personal experience parents? Well, what look... Parent Every parent know every parent knows the situation. Every parent is concerned about their child. They're concerned about the situation. So they're concerned about this. Exactly. They're concerned about this. They're concerning how much time their child is sp spending in their room on their computer. Mm -hmm. That's what parents know just internally. This this can't be good. My kid goes upstairs, closes mm -hmm. the door, does barely comes down to eat. Right. You know? Spending all their time on their iPads, their schoolwork is on the computer, uh, right. you know, video games, everything. There's so much emphasis. 
for us that's to be right start. here all the time. Yes. That's where I start. And that goes into myopia. So staff do the same thing. If I start hitting them on the head, like, guess what? Myopia is an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And this is serious, guys. And we got to address it. I'm not answering the question, which every staff member is asking themselves. What does this mean for me? And right. once you understand that, I think you'll be much more effective in implementing myopia management or any specialty that you choose to instill into your office. Right. And I, you know, I, cause I started working, you know, as a kid in a, in an optical and I worked front desk, I answered the phone, I greeted patients, all that stuff. And it's like, you know, your staff isn't stupid, or at least they shouldn't be like your staff knows what's going on. They, and a lot of times they know it better than the doctor, given the situation, because the doctor may be in denial about it, but the staff sees this every day. They see that, that disconnect that happens. If the doctor isn't spending enough time with that patient, or they're not getting their questions answered. And oftentimes the staff plays that role of pickup, uh, after the, uh, the exam is over and whatnot, they do a lot of the testing or whatever the case may be. Right. So, you know, let's, let's use that then to transition into, you know, the, the meat of this topic, which is, you know, everybody in every industry is feeling that crunch of, you know, they're having a hard time retaining quality staff. Right. I was talking right. with a doctor just the other day who they had to uh, let go an associate doctor in their practice because they, their, their staff was leaving because of the way the associate doctor was treating them and their staff, their, their you know, their, their, their core staff was so important. They were just, they had to make a decision that associate right. doctors got to go, right. but it's not like there's associate doctors lining up who are myopia management, uh, open to yeah. it or, or knowledgeable yeah. into it. So that's the, it's a huge question we're getting right now is like, what can, what can a practice do about staffing? I think let's talk about associate doctors because it's different than staffing, although associate doctors are staffing. I think this is going to be an ongoing problem. If you're bringing an associate without the intention of making them a partner, it's a very risky move. If you hire me to come into your practice and I do that successfully, but the reward is just growing your practice, you have to do one of two things, Matt. You have to make me a partner. So I know I'm working hard because in five years, you and I will share equally. And that's how I've done it. I've brought in two partners over 30 years and they, they, were, they were on the course to become partners. And I kept that promise. The other way I can keep you, Matt, is pay you exceptionally well. Not, not the norm, not a little bit about the norm, because if I don't, if you don't pay me exceptionally well, I'll say, you know what? I'm working for Dr. Herzberg here. I could open up just down the road. I'm doing all the work. And that's really, you've put yourself in a very delicate situation because you've hired me to bring in myopia management, but you've left yourself very vulnerable because once I leave, just like you indicated, where are you going to find another doctor who is as skilled in myopia management? And you know, myopia management is so much patient management. It's not fitting the stupid ortho K lens. It's managing the family. So I would warn, I would caution your, your, your viewers, your listeners, don't bring in an associate with, for the, for the idea of subspecialty. You can bring them in for primary care and you grow the subspecialty. I think that's sound because if that associate leaves, it's easier to find someone who does conventional traditional optometry, medical optometry, contact lenses, glasses, whatever your practice does. And you do the, the subspecialty. But the other way is very delicate. And if you don't want them as partners, you better pay them exceptionally good because then they will be polite to your staff or they know they will be let go. And there's nowhere they're going to get reimbursed like how much you've been paying them. And it, starting out their practice, you really disincentivize them from leaving because they're like, you know, if I open up my practice, where am I going to get this type of six-figure income I was making with Dr. Herzberg? So those are the two things that I've learned from experience. Associate doctors are going to spin out of your office unless you do one, two things. You make them partners and you make them partners pretty quickly. And mm. that could be another conversation for us sure. or you pay them exceptionally well. 
Yeah. I've heard from so many different AAOMC members who they, their associate doctor handles the other stuff. They want to do ortho. K. They love ortho. K. They love interacting with young kids and patients and, and helping these patients interacting with the parents and making a difference. And you know what? They often find an associate doctor who's like, you know what? Ortho case is just not for me. I'm going to do, you know, a right. different specialty or just like you just mentioned, handle the, the general caseload. So right. I think that's and then this way, because associate doctors are just that they're not going to be there for the long haul. And if they are, they're probably not, they're going to not be motivated. They're not going to be inspiring. You know, anyone who gets a job and stays there is happy, but really not entrepreneurial. And I think a lot of doctors want an entrepreneurial doctor, but maybe not want them to become partners or not willing or not ready, whatever the case may be. So you got to give them some skin in the game I in order so. to I keep somebody skin. around. Yeah, I think so. And, and the reward for that, just as an aside, like I said, that could be a topic if, if your readers or listeners want this, is how we've introduced partners that have improved the quality of my life tremendously. So the other topic is staffing, you know, For sure. staff. And that's where I'm getting a lot of questions is everybody's asking me, hey, Nick, I've been looking for someone. I've been running uh, low on staff for a long time. Uh, what? Where do you find good staff? Like there's a place out there that, that has staff that's coming to work for us. And the other thing is they'll complain. They'll say the government is paying people to stay home. Uh, Amazon is paying their, their staff. $24 an hour for just factory workers starting pay and they're giving bonuses. McDonald's is starting salaries, $15 an hour. What the hell am I supposed to do? So that's what I'm getting. Have you heard the same thing? Yeah. You know, and I I've, I've seen it firsthand too. Um, you know, I have a friend who, you know, she was waiting tables pre pandemic and she said, you know, um, I just, I, I can't go back to that job. And I said, why not? She said, because you know, I'm required to, however you feel about masks is relevant to what I'm about to say. But what she was put in this awful role where she was a bartender and a waitress, and uh, she would have to ask people to wear a mask properly, and then found that that was ultimately affecting her tip. You know, it's like, yeah, like your, your pay is based on you having to enforce something that you may or may not even agree with. Like I said, right. that's not a part of this conversation, but right. Right. you know, it's like, she's like, why would I go back to that job? You know, she's, yeah. and, and it, I, I've noticed with a lot of, you know, we had a board member in the AOMC recently who, because of the pandemic, it changed her perspective on life. And she's like, my heart's not in on this anymore. I need to go do something else. And we're like, totally cool. That's fine. So I think that's another thing that's happening with people where they're Maybe. redefining what they yeah. want to do. So let's pick up on one word you said, one sentence. Why would I go back to this job? So the first thing is, where do I get staff members? And there's no place that is definitive. Otherwise, we'd all go there, right? It's like, how do you raise good kids? There's no formula, right? But for us, we've consistently, since the pandemic started, because we did lose a good percentage. For us, three staff members is a good percentage to the pandemic. They retired, like you said, they just, the thought of coming to a health professional office during a pandemic, wearing a mask all day was not for them. Fine. So from the pandemic, we've tried different things. We've tried Facebook, we've tried Indeed, we've tried Zip Recruiters, we've tried Craigslist. We have tried uh, letters to our own staff, our own patient population. We've tried everything that has worked in the past. And we stayed with Indeed. So it, for us, not right or wrong, we stayed with Indeed, which gave us a few applicants every week. And of those few, we would interview one a month virtually. That's how difficult this is. And of the one that we interviewed that we liked, we would set up an in-person interview. So if we did 10 virtuals, Matt, and of the 10, we pick, let's say, five people to come in for an in-person interview or experience. How many of those five do you think showed up to our office? I, I mean, I would say not many, to be perfectly honest with you. I would say zero. So my staff <laughs> member is amazed. Like The person has applied for the job. 
has sent us a resume, has um, gone through the virtual interview, has said they would come in. And on the day of the interview, in person, they don't. It, it's been, uh, in a way, unprecedented. So I have a choice right now. I can blame everyone and anyone, sure. but I blame ourselves. And I think okay. private practitioners, true business owners, pride themselves. I'm like, look, I don't know if it's the government. I don't know if it's Amazon or anybody out there. I do know this is my problem, and I have to do something about it. So what we did is I always give advice every time I lecture is we hired very slowly, very slowly and fired very quickly. So if we did bring someone on, then we let them go literally within weeks because our experience has been, if they're weak starting out, weak meaning they're not catching on, they're this or that, it doesn't get better. Because usually it's the opposite. When someone joins, you're really like, oh boy, they're great, they're great. And maybe a year or two later, they're not as great. So the first thing is we hire slowly, we let go quickly. The, the second thing we do is we solidify the staff who we have. So when we got back, our office was closed for 10 weeks. So let's say we got back here about June, 2020. I gave everybody a raise, even though just about everyone, a raise because number one, they didn't get a raise in 2020. Number two is, or 2019 to 2020. Number two, I wanted to solidify my staff. Everybody was petrified. There was no vaccines. Um, we didn't know much about COVID. They had to wear masks, all this stuff. So the first step is solidifying your staff. Then in December, once vaccines became available, very late 2020, we rewarded the people that we thought really thought stepped up and help our business get back on their feet. And then June of 2021, we did it again. So almost within a year, we've met with every staff member and given most of them two to three salary increases. So I think you need to solidify your staff. You have to solidify your staff that you have. The other thing is when we met with our staff, we were amazed at how many members wanted to go back to school. This blew us away. And if so, if you don't have staff reviews, you're not listening to your staff. And since then, about six people have become, we have one working towards a fellowship, uh, technical fellowship through COVD. We have three people getting certifications to become para-optometric certified technicians, level one to start. We have one going to school to become a licensed optician. We have one that wants to become an optometrist. And guess what? We're helping her pay for her college, even though she's going to leave us if she goes to optometry school. So these are ways that we've solidified our staff. We meet with them. We give them raises when they're appropriate. And we also listen to them and try to help them stay connected with ourselves by making them grow or helping them grow professionally. Yeah. I, I love what you said, because it's like, it's not unlike the concept behind, you know, working with a patient in myopia management or ortho K it's like, you have to change your mindset for that staff member, incentivize them to stay with you and investing in them. And one thing that you've said over and over again, is that like, you know, um, it's not about the lens that you're going to fit on the patient. It's, right. it's showing that patient and their parents that you are the best doctor qualified to, to, to work with them. Absolutely. And I feel like that's a similar message that you're communicating with your staff, like show them that they're valuable, incentivize them, say, look, we're going to, we're going to get through this and you are an important part of this right. and show right. them that respect and value. Right. right. And, and you're exactly right. They're connected and, and we can't, nobody works for us for a salary. You know, I had to adjust my salaries. All of us should have. You just see if, if McDonald's in our community is paying $15 an hour, whether this is not McDonald's, my staff knows that, but Amazon is starting salary in, right down the road at 2450. There is a shift in wages. Now, if I don't have the money, that's not their problem. It's actually your problem. And that would be a strong incentive, in my opinion, to start to specialize in myopia management because I do have the funds, because I made those tough decisions, really tough decisions years ago. 
So it, but it's not just salary because if I'm raising you, Matt, if you work for me and now you were getting 14, 15 and I raise you to 17, you still can go to Amazon and get a lot more money, a lot more money. And Amazon can get you up and trained within days. Whereas here, it takes me months, if not years. So if you start comparing yourself to McDonald's or any other corporate structure like Amazon, you're lost. People work here to, like you said, to grow, to feel respected, to feel appreciated. I hear this over and over again. It's as important as their salary increase. When I say, Matt, we would not be in the position that we are in our office if it wasn't for your help. How does that make you feel when I say that? It makes me feel good. It makes me feel respected and that I'm, I'm, I'm part of the growth of this practice. Yeah. And I think practitioners sometimes are afraid to say that because you say, well, you certainly don't show me Nick with your salary. And then, or, and then, but you know what? You better get that out in a private setting. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're right, Matt, Matt, maybe you're right. Maybe I started you at 12 and now you're at 17. I think you're doing great, but maybe you're doing the job of a, someone for much greater that Mm -hmm. you're only going to get that out when you meet with them. Yeah. So the first step is solidify your staff. We've talked about that. Sure. I want to back up when you start interviewing, it's so tempting to cut corners because we're desperate here. We're too down. We've been too down since June. We're exhausted. But the thing is, is that when you hire quickly, you cut corners, you don't check backgrounds, you don't give proficiency test. So one of the reasons people don't show up is we email them a proficiency test through Indeed, both depending on their job. It could be an aptitude test. Do you know arithmetic? It could be a customer service test. They have all this. And you're taking this test. You're like, crap, no, this is not the office for me. I don't, I don't know. They're going to start giving me tests, you know? So already we're kind of self-selecting the people who actually show up. So you need to hire very slowly. And then when they when you do think they're the right mix and get your staff's input, like we have them come back, Matt, and we have them work maybe an afternoon. We pay them $50 for a few hours to kind of work here, just to observe. And just pay them for that time to see, does my staff think they'll blend in? Do we think they'll blend in? We had a lady come. She was wonderful, Matt. She looked the part. She, she was professional. And at the end of the day, she says, my back is killing me. I can't stand up. You know, so it's not the job for her. We would have hired her and find this out a few weeks later. So once you got the right person, I would do a background check. I would check their references and I would do a drug test. And we've been doing this. I've been uh, professing this to all my seminar attendees literally since we got really a bad batch of employees because we cut corners. Gotcha. Yeah. At the cutting corners part too is, you know, there are some fundamental uh, ways that you want to do the, the culture of your practice, right? Like right. that may not be a great fit for everyone. And I remember in this is pre pandemic, I was talking with uh, a doctor. She was describing so many different scenarios where they were just cycling staff out. And I said, wow, like I I said, don't, I'm sorry if this comes off the wrong way, but like, is, is, is it terrible to work for you? Cause it seems like you guys are always, you know, cycling out staff. And and she said, you know what, we have a very specific culture here and the way that we want to treat patients and the way that we run this practice. And if you don't fit into that, you got to go. It's, she's like, it's just as simple as that. Yeah. It's not simple. I'm telling you, I don't know who this doctor is luckily, but they're the source (laughs) of the issue. Because I hear this all the time. Mm-hmm. The two biggest challenges we all have, no matter where you practice, is cash flow, mm-hmm. keeping cash flow positive and keep it coming in, and staff management. Okay. And I've had friends, good friends, smart friends, fire their whole staff. Can you imagine? And I felt that way. Sometimes I really did feel like that way. And guess mm-hmm. what they did? They had this crazy episode, this psychotic episode where they let everybody go, except maybe one person. Okay. And they rehired everyone. They said, they are fantastic. Now we have the team that we need. So what do you think happened a year later? 
<laughs> I, I feel like everybody's gone again. <laughs> everybody's gone again because it's there. The problem. We're the problem. We're good health providers. Mm, we're good. Okay. We're not bosses. We're not managers. Mm -hmm. We're really just. You know, it's a talent that I never had that I really had to work on. So we're the source of the issue, not the outside forces. Even if that's true or not, it's a good philosophy to have. Okay. So once you go through all this process and be patient. So, for example, for us, we've been two down, aggressively looking for someone from June. And we've had all the same situation. We have phlebotomist reply. We've had all this noise out there. So just recently, we have another employee who's getting shoulder replacement. She's a key employee. She's our optician. And she's going to be out for three months. So we, we're down three people. So do you think at that point, do we panic? No, we meet. We meet weekly. Say, okay, what does this mean for us? But then all of a sudden, we got two applicants. And then guess what? They, they passed the protocol. We started them. So then the instinct is, how are we going to retain them? And I think this is where we could all learn. When you finally get someone who filters through this detailed process is you can't overwhelm them because our, our instinct is, oh, Matt's great. He has experience. He worked for his dad. He's wonderful. I interviewed him. He's professional. His background check is all good. So we start pounding on you. And, and guess what? You produce. You mm -hmm. start producing, Matt. Everybody loves you. And then a few months go by and say, oh, Matt called out or Matt forgot to put a contact lens order in, or Matt didn't get back to this. Why? Because we drowned him. Mm. So what we do is we train very slowly. We have a process where they're just looking, just observing. It kills us because we need them. And the second thing is we have something called help guides. And help guides are just written outlines of how the process should be done. So answering the phone. In our office, it's thank you for calling eye care professionals Nick speaking, how may I help you? So oftentimes there's what we call system decay. Instead of yelling at, at, at Matt, if he's not answering the phone, hey, Matt, do we have a help guide? Oh, yeah, I worked on it when you hired me. Can you pull it out? Let's look at it because I notice people are just doing their own thing. So we have instruction manuals that we ask new employees to either write, if we don't have one, like outlines, like greet patient by name answer phone, polite, you know, whatever your procedure is, so that when Matt or this new employee slips, you have some background. So if you really want to solidify the staff you have, if you have to tell them, what does it mean to do a good job, whether it's pre-testing, answering the phone, or ordering lenses, or getting back to patients. So Definitely. that, that the, the first step is hiring. We went through that a little bit. Then the second step is when you hire, don't give them too much and have them either read procedures or help guides that you have. If you don't have them, that's okay. If you're hiring a pretester, let them write an outline of what it took for them to learn how to take a clean topography. Because that's always been an issue in our offices. We really need clean mm -hmm. uh, topographies. And then yeah. the third thing is saying, listen, Matt, I hired you to be an optometric technician. In order to successfully fulfill this role, you need to learn these many procedures. So what happens is we now give you, let's say 20, 30 help guides to be an excellent technician. And I'll say to you, Matt, so we hired someone yesterday, really a good candidate. We're just lucky to get her. And if we weren't looking, just like myopia management, you start a practice and you're not hitting the goals you want, just keep at it. Luck will come your way. I think she's going to be a strong applicant. And the first thing I said to her, and I didn't hire her. She just met me in passing. I said, listen, we are not expecting anything from you for a long time. Learn at your own pace. Go through the process. And all of a sudden, her face seems so relaxed. It's like, wow, how nervous is all hell. I, I don't know anything about eyes. She doesn't know OD from OS, from up, from down. And that just relaxed her. So once you have all these help guides, she's going to get a position agreement. The position agreement is the list of instruction manuals that she'll need to, or, or these help guides, these procedures that she'll need to master to do a good job. So there's so far we talked about two steps and I added a third. The first step is interview. The second step is these instruction manuals we call help guides. 
And the third thing is position agreements that encompass what does your job entail? Because when you get a new employee, you start giving them all sorts of stuff. I start giving you, hey, Matt, can you start ordering supplies for us? Hey, mm-hmm. Matt, can you fill up the snack bags? Hey, Matt, can you get, order uh, clear care? We're running low on that. Hey, mm-hmm. Matt, can you answer the phone? Hey, Matt, can you? And it's after a while, Matt says yes, because he's fantastic. But all of a sudden, we're going outside his position. And eventually, Matt starts making mistakes. Mm-hmm. And then we blame Matt, not our systems. Gotcha. And is there is there like a testing protocol, you know, no. for all this stuff that you've laid work. on them? No. We treat every, you know me, we treat everybody like family. So it's kind of like my kids, do I test them if they did their wash? And they, they, they're not going to do it, right? So I just go back and I say, Matt, I noticed that you're answering the phone. Thank you for calling eye care professionals. Matt speaking. That's it. If you didn't say, how may I help you? In the past, I would say, Matt, the heck? You've been here a year. There's a, you know, what's wrong with you? And all of a sudden you turn around saying, you jerk. You keep bringing in more and more things like this myopia management. I'm answering these phones. I'm getting these questions that I don't know. Instead of saying, hey, Matt, I notice everybody's answering the phone differently. Do we have a help guide? And you'd say, I don't know. All right, let's find one. And we pull everybody together and say, look, how are we supposed to be answering the phone? And then during the meeting, someone may say, you know what, Dr. D, this is ridiculous. You keep on bringing in new services. I don't have time to say hello, let alone thank you for calling eye care professionals. Nick speaking, how may I help you? And then you know the core problem. And you have addressed this, even though you don't want to hear it, before everybody starts quitting or works suboptimally. That's why position agreements are important. That's why these help guides are important. And that's why just getting the right staff. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, this reminds me of, you know, the, the ideal employee. I mean, we've all seen employees that are just like, this is just a paycheck. I'm here, you know, but you're going to cycle that person out. Like what you were saying is like fire quickly, you know, um, if it's not the right fit. So I think it's important also to remind people that like a, a valuable staff member wants to do a good job. They, they, they like, you know, if, they, if, if they're, they're messing not, up on something, they want to improve and do better. Exactly. And it's hard because we're not good managers. You're hundred percent right. And sometimes I would put the wrong person in the, the right person, in the wrong position. So maybe you're great at organization. You keep me on track, but you hate talking to people. It happens, right? That's a person that shouldn't be up front working with patients, vice versa. I have so many people that are bubbly and great. But man, for the life of me, they can't remember anything I tell them. So they're not going to be in the organization, the part of the office that requires organization, but you're 100% right. They all want to do a good job, which is going back to solidifying. We talked about reviews, and that's really important. If you don't do your reviews, at least right now we're doing them biannually because we want to solidify the staff we have. We have a great staff, and I know I will lose them. I will lose them if I don't listen to them. We also just try to make this a fun place to work because I have to tell you, 90% of the time, it's not that much fun here. Patients are demanding, healthcare is stressful, doctors are grumpy. So it's not Chuck E. Cheese here. You know, I like to make it a lie to you and say, yeah, my office is a joy. But overall, just like life, sometimes family life is not a joy. But I'll bring in bagels tomorrow morning. It's Wednesday, Burton. Morning bagels, people look forward to it. I I started this just when the pandemic started to lighten up. We have five minute meetings every day, Matt, to see how's everybody feeling? What's going on in your life? Anybody have COVID? What's going on in the office? Five minute meetings. I treat everybody to lunch on Fridays. You know why? I noticed nobody wants to work on Fridays. We're closed Saturdays, we're closed Sundays. So yeah, it costs us, I would say, you know me, I calculate everything. It costs us about $12,000 a year in these, parties, things, $1,000 a month, big money. But you know what? The staff turnover, $12,000 I lose like within the first week when a good staff member leaves. Right. And that's just keeping my office worthy of you coming in every day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just definitely food works for us a lot. Food seems to work. Fortunately, I'm glad it's not diamonds or, or something like that, right. but food works. <laughs> Because it's a token of appreciation. By the way, I really do feel, and we can close on this because I know I'm running long, is it has to be me or one of the other doctors 
that goes shopping because that is an extension of my words. When I say, Matt, you really mean a lot to me, but if I have an Uber Eats, bring the bagels. Mm -hmm. Different than when the doctor shows up, went to a special bagel store Mm -hmm. on Black Friday. We were talking before we went on that you shop some stuff from Black Friday about 15 years ago, maybe longer. A tradition I made is nobody wants to work on Black Friday in my office. I don't want to work on Black Friday. So I made it fun. It's not only do they get a treat, I go shopping. I used to go, thank goodness, now it's no longer like 4 a.m. on on the Friday and buy someone a little gift that I got on sale. I buy 25 of them. It's not the gift. It's that the doctor got up at 4 a.m. and bought us slippers, scarves, makeup, whatever the heck I find. Mm -hmm. And and now it's become a tradition that they look forward to. And this is why I think that the average tenure in my office is 15 years, even after the pandemic. Right. And, you know, it, something that you had mentioned earlier, I think definitely needs to be repeated is that, you know, uh, if, if this is that job down the street, they can be trained in weeks. If it's a job with you, it's like, so if you got to keep cycling people out, that's, that's right. not just money, that's time and time is money. So you're just, it's, you're going to oh, have yeah. to retrain people. So, and, you know, and, making yeah. people feel like they're valuable and, and, and respected and do those little things to make, you know, to establish that this is, you know, a great place to work. And I, you know, from working in an optical and maybe I'm biased because I work for my parents, but like, you know, it was a lot more interesting to work in a practice and in an optical, they had all this crazy machinery, you know, at first where I was like, what does this do? What does this do? And then I'm using that equipment to, you know, to do, to uh, do a topography or whatever the case may be. And so there's a lot of like interesting features in, uh, in an optometry practice. And, right. and I wonder if you could even like, use the incentive of a myopia control coordinator in your practice to grow, you know, to grow someone and find their niche in that practice. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think um, to expand on what you said, I think that we do have a lot of cool stuff in uh, optometry. Office, totally. But I think one of the core reasons I brought myopia management in is to be more profitable. I know some practitioners out there are thinking, yeah, Nick, I don't have $12,000 a year to buy lunch. I don't have the luxury of giving people raises. We're in a pandemic. When you're in a niche market, whatever that is, dry eye or sclerals or low vision, I don't know what your niche is, but let's call it myopia management. You do have more flexibility as far as profitability because you're not capitated by fees reimbursed by insurances. We got that. So let's take this uh, coordinator that you're referring to. They take a long time to nurture, a long time. And there's a lot of skills that go into a coordinator. They have to have the good people skills, obviously. But they have to be organized because to be honest with you, um, I'm not ordering lenses. I'm not taking topographies. So that's administrative technical skills. But also, I'm not on the phone with patients when they call to say, I need an appointment with Dr. D or I lost the contact lens. So you, once you find that right person, you need to nurture their growth or whatever is most important to them. And if you're not meeting with them because you're crazy busy and I don't have time, then you are going to be like your friend who's just churning staff members. Nobody in my office, we have about 22 employees right now with the new employees, is working for me, for me, with me, for salary. No, Mm -hmm. they're doing it because how I make them feel. Mm -hmm. And once that becomes non-congruent with how they want to be felt, then they leave. It's a simple Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? I, I totally get that that doc out there is saying, I don't have the money to spend on these spiffs like Dr. D does. But you know what absolutely doesn't cost any money is respect, uh, honesty, communication, checking in with your staff and just saying like, look, this is time I set aside. Tell me about how you feel about this job. Yeah. You know, create a relationship because yeah. Yeah. I don't know about anybody else, but in my personal experience, I worked at Taco Bell. I worked in fast food uh, when I I lived uh, uh, for a summer in Estes Park, Colorado. One of the best jobs I had was Taco Bell. My boss was an amazing, the owner of this franchise was amazing. And she treated every employee 
with respect yeah. and consideration yeah. and gave you the time of day and the opportunity to communicate with her on what yeah. your issues were, yeah. what you were struggling with. I mean, it's fast food. You're not struggling with much, right. but you know, she was like almost not your friend, but she was somebody you could respectfully yeah. communicate with. And McDonald's has 300% turnover in a year. In other words, you're replacing your staff three times almost in a year in these fast foods. But ODs will tell me, and they're right, I don't have time for this. And number two, internally, I think they're afraid. I'm really afraid if I sit with you, you're going to ask for more money. You're going to ask maybe for evenings off that I can't give you. You know, it's kind of be careful what you wish for. Today's a Thursday. I just had a staff meeting. Sometimes I dread them because I my head hurts sometimes with the amount of stuff that needs to get done and how slowly it does get done. But if I don't meet with them, that's when you're going to start turning staff. So I know this probably doesn't answer what they want. People want to know, let me know where to get staff. The answer is they're right in front of you. Solidify the staff you have. Get good at the staff you manage. Right. And then your hiring process got to get better. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. You're just mm -hmm. going out on dates. Nothing is turning into something worth investing your time in. Right. And, and I can't overemphasize that. I know it's not what you want to hear, but that's how life works. Right. You've got to put in the work. Myopia management. The reason I think it's such a great niche market, we had one of the questions. It's like, everybody's in, their, in agreement that myopia management should be in private practice. But honestly, I have a hard time integrating it because you haven't made the time. And the way you make time is you either drop insurances, if you're busy that busy, or you somehow make the time. If you don't devote yourself, all this stuff, you're just spinning your wheels. You're just going to work and you're leaving exhausted. And the worst part about it is you haven't been financially reimbursed for your exhaustion. There's no worse mm -hmm. feeling is being busy. And at the end of the day, feeling washed out like many times I do. But man, at the end of the week now, you don't have a check. Let me right. tell you, that happened to me plenty of times. It's the worst feeling. Right. Yeah. And I remember you talking about that uh, on stage at Vision by Design, actually. And uh, all right. So let's let's uh, cap it there unless there's anything else you want to mention. No, I think it's a good place. I, I, I hope everybody's doing well out there. I hope they're safe. And I, I enjoy this. I think we should continue doing it once a month. For I sure. encourage your, your listeners to send in questions or their biggest issues and just not looking for like key answers. They're all global answers. The, the answer today is take care of the staff you have, clean up the systems you have in your office because otherwise you'd just be spending your wheels. Yeah. And making the same mistake over and over again if you don't exactly. fix it. Exactly. All right. Well, you know, this... That. This is a podcast that is brought to you by members like Nick Despeditas, full members of the AAOMC who give their actual real life money and support to make this organization what it is to put out content like this. And if that's appealing to you, then consider becoming a member and you can do so at aaomc.org. And I want to echo what Dr. D was saying. We're here to answer your questions. That's why I have him on. He's a, a practice management expert. He's been through several different stages of growing a practice of myopia management specialty. So please send us your questions. You can do that at thecorrectedview at gmail.com. You can put them on our Facebook group. Uh, if you're in the, if you're a full member, you can do it in our Google group. Just Send us those questions and we'll put them to Nick and get them answered. So, Nick, thank you so much for coming on once again. And for everybody else, we'll see you at the next one. Well, that's it for this episode of The Corrected View. And if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to thank the standard members of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, whose annual dues and support make it possible for the AAOMC to put out education, awareness, and content like this. Mm -hmm also like to give a special shout out that I'm going to be giving out at the end of every Corrective View episode for one full year. And that shout out goes to Dr. Somi O oh for her very generous contribution at the lifetime member level of our fundraiser. Thank you to everyone who contributed and keeping the AAOMC alive. You are awesome.